The way we treat human remains is part of what defines a culture, and many archaeologists think that the ceremonial treatment of human remains is one of the markers of the beginning of human civilization. According to the Property and Environmental Research Council, the United States puts as much steel into the making of coffins in a single year as it took to build the Golden Gate Bridge. We pour more reinforced concrete in the making of burial vaults in a year than it would take to build a two-lane highway from New York City to Detroit. Clearly, we take the treatment of our mortal remains seriously, but not always so. The strange story of what happened to three famous people after they shuffled off their mortal coil illustrates the complex relationship we have with and reaction we have to human remains. It is a macabre bit of history that deserves to be remembered. Oliver Cromwell rose to prominence as a general in the period of English civil wars called the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. When Parliament decided to try the imprisoned King Charles I, Cromwell supported the trial, thinking it the only way to end the civil wars, and was one of 59 members of the court who signed the King's death warrant. However, when the time of the execution came, no officer wanted to sign the actual order to behead the King and be responsible for regicide. It was Cromwell who signed the order. Charles I was executed by beheading on January 30th, 1649. When the wars ended with a parliamentary victory, a republic called the Protectorate was created in 1653. Cromwell was made Lord Protector, the head of government, for life. But Cromwell only lived another five years, dying of an infection in September 1658. He was interred at Westminster Abbey with an elaborate funeral, fit for a king. But the Protectorate proved unable to rule successfully without him. His third son, Richard Cromwell, was appointed Lord Protector, but he lacked his father's connections within both Parliament and the army, and rashly tried to extend the Protectorate's power. While he was never officially deposed, Richard Cromwell was removed from power, and in the confusing aftermath, Parliament restored the monarchy, inviting Charles' son, Charles II, to return after a promise of reforms, creating a constitutional monarchy. While the monarchy was restored in May 1660, Charles II was not officially crowned until April 1661. But the restoration of the monarchy created a difficult legacy for Oliver Cromwell, who had signed the death warrant for the previous King Charles I, as well as anyone who had participated in the trial. Understandably upset at both the execution of his father and the precedent that that execution set in terms of the divine right of kings, Charles II and the new parliament had 12 members of the court that had tried Charles I tried for treason and executed. But three of the ringleaders, Cromwell, John Bradshaw, who had been the presiding judge at the trial, and Henry Ireton, who was Cromwell's son-in-law, who had also signed the death warrant, were already deceased. Not content with merely hanging, drawing, and quartering the dozen regicides, Charles II also had the remains of Cromwell, Bradshaw, and Ireton disinterred and symbolically executed, publicly hanging their corpses in January 1661. Their heads were then removed and placed on spikes in front of Westminster Hall, where, having been embalmed, they lasted for some time. Cromwell's severed head remained on a spike on the roof of Westminster Hall until the 1680s, when it went missing, by some accounts falling after the rotted spike fell in a storm. The head, or at least what purported to be Cromwell's head, reappeared in a museum for curiosities in London in 1710. After the museum proprietor's death, the head somehow ended up in the hands of a drunkard and purported descendant of the Cromwell family, who had a habit of passing the thing around in bars. It was taken from him in payment for a debt, and in 1799 was sold to another pair who hoped to display it. The exhibition of the head turned out to be a failure, but the family of the owner kept possession of the head until 1815, when it was sold to a private collector named Wilkinson. But then doubts were raised about the authenticity of the remains, and at least one other pretender arose. Finally, in 1934, two scientists, a eugenicist and an anthropologist, compared the Wilkinson head to busts portraits in the death mask of Oliver Cromwell, and in a 104-page report, it determined it with moral certainty to be Cromwell's head. The Wilkinson family, which had possessed the head in a wooden box since 1815, had it interred in a secret location at Sydney Sussex College in 1960. The head of the once proud Lord Protector, buried with the honors of a king, went from being a warning to villains, to a curiosity, to a collection, before finding their final resting place more than 200 years after the general's death. Oddly, it was also the English Civil War that affected the mortal remains of Catherine Parr, Queen Consort and sixth wife of Henry VIII.
Catherine Parr had been twice widowed already when she caught the eye of King Henry VIII in 1543. The 52-year-old king had had his fifth wife, Catherine Howard, executed in 1542. He suffered from a number of issues with his health and had become increasingly irascible. 31-year-old Parr had developed a romantic relationship with Thomas Seymour, brother of the king's third wife, Jane, but when the king proposed she felt that she had to accept, placing country above her personal concerns. Henry and Catherine were married July 12, 1543. She was a popular queen and helped to reconcile Henry with his daughters, Mary and Elizabeth, and in 1544 acted as the king's regent while Henry campaigned in France. Henry died January 28, 1547, leaving Catherine a large stipend as Queen Dowager, but she renewed her relationship with Thomas Seymour and married him a mere five months after Henry's death, a move that alienated both Henry's daughter, Lady Mary, and King Edward. In 1548, she became pregnant, a surprise since she had not conceived a child in her first three marriages. She and Thomas moved to an estate in Gloucestershire called Sudley Castle, accompanied by a ward, Lady Jane Grey. Catherine gave birth to a daughter, who she named Mary, on August 30th. Catherine died six days later of an infection, commonly at the time usually called childbed fever. She was entombed under the chapel of Sudley Castle. It was said to be the first Protestant funeral held in English in England. Lady Jane Grey, who had later briefly become queen after the death of Edward, was chief mourner. There is no record of what happened to her daughter after the age of two, and she is generally assumed to have died in childhood. Her husband became implicated in a plot against the king and was executed in March 1549. The remains of the queen consort, wrapped in wax cloth and encased in a lead coffin under an obscure chapel, were nearly forgotten. Nearly a hundred years later, the castle became a basis of royalist support for the English Civil War. The castle changed hands in the fighting and the chapel was used by the parliamentarians as a slaughterhouse. The castle was severely damaged in the war, and in 1649 it was slighted, that is, deliberately destroyed by the parliamentarians to prevent it being used as a military post. The former queen was now entombed underneath a forgotten ruin. In May 1782, 234 years after Queen Catherine was entombed, as described in a work by 19th century historian Agnes Strickland, a group of lady sightseers visiting the ruins of the chapel noticed a block of alabaster and dug beneath it. Less than a foot beneath the earth, they found the leaden coffin of Queen Catherine. They opened holes in the coffin and found the remains to be in a remarkable state of preservation. Then they reburied the coffin. The coffin was uncovered again that summer by the person renting the land who investigated further to find that under the cloth. The skin on the queen's arm was still soft and white. But merely opening the form-fitted coffin and exposing the remains to air meant that the remains would not stay so preserved. Now that the location of the remains was known, the coffin was opened again by curious sightseers. In 1792, the coffin was opened by a group of what has been described as ruffians and drunkards that did significant damage to the remains, by some accounts dismembering the corpse and taking all the queen's hair as souvenirs. In 1810, Sudley Castle was sold to the Duke of Buckingham and Chandos, who had Catherine's remains removed to his family tomb. By then, the corpse, which had remained so well preserved for over two centuries, had decayed to nothing, but a skeleton. In the mid-19th century, the house and chapel were restored, and an ornate tomb with a marble effigy was created for Catherine Parr's remains. She was moved to her final resting place, the most ornate of the tombs of any of Henry's six wives, in 1863. But by then, all that was left of her remains was described as brown dust. But as strange as the story of Queen Catherine's remains is, it is not nearly as peculiar as that of the Wyoming outlaw, George Parrott. Not a lot is known about the early life of George Parrott. He was born in France in 1834, and his nickname, Big Nose George, was because he famously had a rather large nose, which ironically resembled the beak of a parrot. There's no clear record of how or when he immigrated to the United States or what led him to the life he chose, but by the 1870s, he was part of a notorious gang of outlaws in the American West. The gang were petty highwaymen who robbed freight wagons, payrolls, and stagecoaches in the Wyoming, Montana, and Dakota territories. In August 1878, Parrott and his gang had hatched a plan to rob a Union Pacific train by sabotaging the track on an isolated stretch, hoping to cause the train to derail. A work crew found the damage and the plot was thwarted and a posse was put on the outlaw's trail. Two lawmen, a deputy sheriff and a Union Pacific detective tracked the gang to their hideout, but the gang ambushed and murdered the lawmen. The following February, the gang scored its most famous robbery, capturing a wealthy merchant they knew was carrying money to buy merchandise, despite the merchant traveling with a military escort. Reports vary, but Parrott and his gang made off with as much as $14,000.
But that big score was George Parrott's last. In 1881, he was in a Montana bar and he had too much to drink and boasted about the murder of the two lawmen in 1878. Realizing that a reward was involved, someone contacted the law and Parrott was arrested in Miles City. Parrott had reason to be afraid. It was just taken by train to Rollins, Wyoming to stand trial for the murders. Another gang member, Charlie Burris, called Dutch Charlie, who had also participated in the ambush of the two lawmen, had been pulled off the train in the town of Carbon before he could get to Rollins to stand trial. A group of vigilantes demanded that he confessed, and when he refused, they lynched him from a telegraph pole. On his way to Rollins in 1881, Parrott was also pulled off the train and threatened with hanging. To save his life, he admitted to the murders and gave details of the crime. He was saved from lynching, but when he reached Rollins, he was quickly convicted, and in April 1881 was sentenced to death by hanging. Desperate, Big Nose George planned an escape. He had managed to secretly cut through a bolt of his leg shackles, and when a jailer named Robert Rankin came to check on him at night, he assaulted the jailer, beating him with the heavy leg chains. But Rankin's wife heard the commotion, and according to newspapers at the time, quickly arrived on scene with a six-shooter and held the prisoner until help arrived. When the news spread through the town that Parrot had attacked Rankin, a mob formed. According to the Quincy Daily Herald on March 24th, Big Nose George was taken by a party of men out of the jail at 10.55. There being no convenient trees, a noose was thrown over the crossbar of a telegraph pole. The noose was placed around his neck, and George was forced to climb a 14-foot ladder. His last words reportedly were, I will jump, boys, and break my neck. But it wasn't that clean. George had managed to free his hands from the ropes that had been used to bind him. As he hung on the rope, he grabbed the pole, trying to hold himself up. His legs were locked in iron, so he could not grip with them. Slowly, his strength failed, and he slipped down the pole until the noose tightened, and he slowly strangled. It was a gruesome end for a bad man, but what happened to his remains was even more bizarre than his demise. With no one to claim the body, George's remains were taken by two doctors, Thomas McGee and John Osborne, who decided to study the corpse to see if they could determine the physical characteristics that explain George's criminality. During their efforts, they sawed off the top of his skull to examine his brain. The skull top was given to Dr. McGee's teenage assistant. It's not really clear what experiments were performed on the unfortunate remains of George of the large proboscis, but at some point skin was removed from the cadaver and sent to Denver to be tanned. Sources differ on what all was made from the leather of Big Nose George. Some say gloves, some claim a doctor's bag, but there's certainty that part of George was used to make a pair of two-toned shoes. And as an added macabre twist, when Dr. Osborne in 1892 became the first Democrat to be elected territorial governor of Wyoming, he wore his Big Nose George skin shoes to the inaugural ball. Newspaper stories in the 1930s indicated that the Osborne family still had the shoes, but it was unclear what had become of the rest of George's remains. In 1950, a crew digging a foundation in downtown Rollins uncovered a whiskey barrel that included some human bones and the bottom half of a skull. Some townspeople recalled the story that the top of George's skull had been given to Dr. McGee's assistants. In the time since, the assistant, Lillian Heath, had attained a medical degree, becoming the first licensed female doctor in the state of Wyoming. Not only was Dr. Heath still alive, she still had the top of George's skull, which she had variously used as an ashtray, a pencil holder, and a doorstop. Lillian traveled to Rollins, where the top of the skull was found to be a perfect fit with the part of the skull found in the barrel. The lower part of the skull, the shoes made from his skin, and a death mask of the Big Nose Bandit are now on display in the Carbon County Museum in Rollins, Wyoming the top of his skull and the manacles that he wore while being hanged are on display in the Union Pacific Museum in Omaha, Nebraska. While newspapers at the time say that the rest of George's remains were interred, the location of those bones has never been revealed. The odd story of what happened to the human remains of Oliver Cromwell, Catherine Parr, and Big Nose George Parrott illustrates the complex relationship that humans have with human remains. Sometimes revered and sometimes reviled, the reaction to the abuse of these famous corpses reveals the human fascination with the hereafter. All three of these sets of remains, while treated differently upon death, ended up becoming curiosities. And their story deserved to be remembered, if for no other reason than how we humans treat our dead says much about the living. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. 
If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section and I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe. <laughs>